We're back. We're back. And we have the return of the amazing. I want to say the thrice great, but it's only the twice great. It's the second time Peter Crone's been on this podcast. He uh, he was a speaker at our most recent Fit for Service event down in Lockhart at the Farm. Peter's been a friend of mine for the last few years, and he has been uh, an amazing teacher for the last few years. And he taught a workshop. He uh, uh, with the with the agreement from my brother Eric Godsey, another one of the coaches and and uh, multi time guest on this podcast. The agreement of Eric Godsey uh, did in front of the entire two hundred plus person crowd a little breakdown of Eric's childhood story, and so much of that resonated with me. And I knew we had a podcast coming uh, at some point over the weekend that I actually wanted this for myself. And uh, some of you may wonder <laughs> why I would choose to dig into this shit uh, on the podcast, but it's fucking powerful. And the reason it's powerful is because a lot of us share similar stories. Um, I felt that first listening to uh, Peter detail Eric Godsey. And as he did that, certain parts of me were unlocked. Certain parts of me really resonated with that story and certain parts of me were able to let go of that story. So it is my hope um, even though we all come from different backgrounds, that some parts of this story will resonate with you. And if they don't, totally cool. But hopefully it can give you some of the tracking material necessary to actually look into your own life and see what stories you've created based on how your your little child was treated and based on uh, what experiences you had as a kid. What story did that create that you still live to this day? And the odds are there is a story. The odds are very fucking high that there's still a story. So if you get real honest with yourself, and as Paul Check says, you stop bullshitting yourself, um, I think you'll be able to dig in a little deeper. And then hopefully, as I'm doing, I haven't mastered it by any fucking means, not in a week, hopefully you can begin to replace that story. Uh, we dive into my story. Uh, there's, It's hard for me to talk about it still. And... Um, and it's illuminating. And in the end of it, pretty fucking rad because I was able to replace that story. So I love Peter Crone. He is absolutely incredible. Uh, we'll have all of his links in the show notes. He's running a couple of different tier programs for people to, to work with him online. And I think that's absolutely fantastic. Be sure to check him out on Aubrey's podcast. He's jumped on for his fourth one here. If you haven't heard him on my show before, check that out. Uh, that was pre pan pre pandemic. So a few years back that we got together at his house in LA. Uh, since then, he has got some land in NorCal and moved off to Lake Tahoe for not very obvious reasons. And, um, you know, he, he's just a, a, such a unique, amazing person. He's got a brilliant voice. I think I remember him saying, he's just a boy from Dover <laughs> on that first episode. And that's always stuck, stuck in my mind. Um, just a great guy who, who I absolutely adore and we'll have back on this podcast. And without further ado, my brother, Peter Crone. All right, we're good. We're ready to rock and roll. Let's go. It's been too fucking long since we've had the chance to podcast with each other. It's been a minute. I was trying to think, because in that house, when you came to mine, that was 17 or 18. No, maybe 18 or 19. 18 or 19. But either way, it's still like freaking two plus three years. Yeah, and, and, and especially in the last... Two, three years with everything that's kind of gone on. Well, to fill me in. What's been happening? Well, you know, <laughs> I'm mean, not aware. You, you said it best. You're like, it turns out there's some fucking evil people in the world. And I was right. like, yes. Yeah. And thank you. Right. Because yeah. so many people in your field and life coaching or in anything else you'd fucking call it, whether you're spiritual or anything on Gaia, you know, for that matter. Yeah. Even though they've got some deep state videos and shit like that, for the most part, it seems like they lean into only looking at the light. Yeah. And not being able to see, you know, kind of the, the dirt and the grime of, of, you know, the fullness of our experience here. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. so that was fucking refreshing and breath, fresh air for sure. To, to hear people like myself speak about that or yeah. just to say, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think it was quite shocking for me because I, as compassionate as I like to be and understand that full scope of humanity and that like truly everyone's doing the best they can within the level of awareness they have, 
You know, I'd always like attributed even like a man who's a bit abusive to a spouse or a girlfriend, which I don't condone and is pretty abhorrent. But nonetheless, if you knew everything that that man had been through and perhaps had been reprimanded consistently by his own dad or hit, sort of a language he learned that then he superimposed onto that next generation, right? It doesn't, again, doesn't condone it, but at least you have some compassion, you can understand it, right? So it sort of falls more under the auspices of a little bit of trauma and someone just trying to figure it out. But then you look at what's been going on, I'm like, no, no, they know what they're doing and it's literally just bad. It's yeah. like, yeah, that falls into a different bracket, I think, of something sort of satanic and evil. And Yeah, it's it's an anti-life, right? Evil, the palindrome yeah. of, love, of live. And, you know, as Paul Cech says, you know, it's just moving against, if it's, if it's not, if it's life affirmative, it's pro-life, pro-live. And if yeah. it's, life denying or freedom denying or anything that's associated with that and you'd say that that's that's evil it's a fair definition doesn't mean they need to have a mustache and twist that shit right behind some closed door somewhere you know or a trident <laughs> yeah exactly with a little red tail yeah. a spade on the end yeah um no it's 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 kind of i think for all of us and even you know the likes of this group here you aubrey the tribe and special collection of humans like i think we're all kind of a little bit both in shock you know, but equally, like anything, I feel there's a response that is happening that itself is quite beautiful, right? Even in the face. Like if we look at what even I was doing with people yesterday, one-on-one, -on -one, bringing what we could say is their version of evil, albeit perhaps in a container that is better intended, people are trying to live good lives, trying to do the right thing, and perhaps through their own subconscious oblivion, they're self-sabotaging or maybe saying hurtful things, but it's not malintent, right? But then if you look at that individualistically and then you take that collectively, it feels like, wow, we, big W, humanity, are doing shadow work right now, yeah. right? right? And, and this is that cancer tumor that was over there in the corner Apparently Washington DC, but <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's coming to the surface, you know. And yeah. we, we need some serious chemo. Yeah, that, and cough. that's that's it. We're planting seeds, literally and figuratively. We're getting our hands in the dirt, literally and figuratively, right? We're yeah. we're, we're weeding our own gardens, yeah, uh, literally and figuratively. And I think that's such a it's a palpable thing that I gravitate towards. And at the same time. There has been a large, what appears to be a large group of people that still have blinders on. That yeah. are still like, hey, you know, that was one thing. Now we got to worry about Ukraine. Forget this other shit. You know, and it's like, do we now? Do we, do we right. just pass that, sweep yeah. that under the rug? Yeah. So um, with that, you, and I do want to talk about, I want to dive in if we can. Sure. You might have to bill me on Venmo. But <laughs> I, I want a I free lesson here. It's going to be under 600 it's, bucks, though, otherwise we have to report it. Exactly, or 800,000 IRS soldiers are going to show up at your fucking house well-armed. Um, yeah, we, we, you went through, and, you, and my brother Godzi, I'm sure, would have no problem talking about this, um, but I'm not going to dive in his story. His story paralleled a lot with my story, and it was very illuminating. And so... I'd love to dive into that because as we, you know, I can, I think I can link the what conversation we had yesterday with some of my still lingering fears around the world itself that we dove into right from the jump. Yeah. yeah. Can we go there? Of course. Whatever you want, my friend, I'm Fuck here yeah. for you. Yeah. So I didn't develop a stutter like Godzi who was very open about it, yeah. um, but obviously developed quite a bit from my childhood. Yeah. You know, so. Um, some of the parallels without diving into history, I just forget parallels personal path um my parents fought a lot they would get like you know like two rams butting heads screaming in each other's face fucking plates flying window you know yeah. telephone flying through the through the door from a very young age and it felt like i had to walk on eggshells quite a bit because yeah. i knew they were ticking time bombs they were the ticking time bombs and i really felt like just a real sense of unease yeah and I didn't feel safe. For sure. I didn't feel safe from a young age. Yeah, yeah. And you, you cleverly and, and fucking hilariously pointed out <laughs> after you were talking with Godzi, you're like, yeah, look at Kyle. A man that size with martial arts and guns background, he, you know, he feels safe. And I was like, fuck, dude. Fucking just, just expose him naked standing there, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, yeah. It, and so there is so much truth in that. And I appreciate your humor and your directness because it fucking, it's, it sings right to me. Good. Um, but looking at that, 
and we can keep going further into that or yeah. you know yeah no i mean look you you're such a sweetheart we sadly haven't spent as much time together as i'd like and maybe we can change that moving forward but um yeah, I think one of the big compliments I certainly got from a lot of people yesterday is one, my precision, but then two, the humor and the levity that I'm able to bring around a subject that could be like a real owie for people. You know, it's like certainly the people I spoke to, the woman with her issue and what she was sharing, like it's, it's pretty dramatic scenario, right? And yet to be able to disarm that. So equally when I pointed out to you with love, but also like I can see that. And so I'm glad you're bringing it to the forefront. Um, yeah, I mean, a kid regardless of aptitude, intelligence, or now size as you as a man, like your internal experience being in an environment like that, that is hostile, mercurial, and unpredictable is going to leave a kid in a state of terror. Just period. Doesn't matter, right? So some of the ways that you've adapted, obviously, is, as you said, like the martial arts, the fighting, like the, the size, the weights, the guns, the methods of protection, right, we could say. So there's different ways that we can arm ourselves and it's totally fine. You know, like there's a lot of people out there. I mean, like Bruce Lee, for example, probably like weighs literally half than you, but yeah, obviously knew what he was doing. But I would assert that he, he it was more a pursuit out of perhaps passion, curiosity, commitment, discipline. Whereas what we want to look at is the how somebody's garnering protection, right? So... What would you say, where did you start that journey for yourself of learning to protect yourself? And it may even have been in that house, right? Because it might have looked like, yeah, I can't fucking it was do a roundhouse that. kick, but I can hide in my closet as a yeah, kid. You know? the, the, the home, I just shut down. I would go as far inside as I possibly could. Yeah. You know, in a, you ever see the movie Get Out? When she, she hits him with like this fucking hypno hypnosis and he gets like he's falling through a black portal and the screen gets smaller and smaller of his vision. Oh, uh, no, I haven't. That reminds me of two things. One, ketamine. Uh-huh. And two, what I would do when shit hit the fan. Okay. I would just fucking slide as far, many layers inward as I could Yeah. in solitude. Got you it. You know, like, I'm not here. I'm a rock. I'm a rock. I'm a rock. That kind of shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And from what age do you remember? Like, approximately. I know it was earlier because I have, you know not great memories from when I was pretty young in old, in older houses, like when I was two, three. Yeah. Um, but consistently that was my mode by five or six. Yeah. And, uh, in particular, we moved to, uh, back to the Bay area from Oregon. Actually, we might've been in a different part of the Bay, but we moved to a house in Sunnyvale that I remember very well from, from that point on, which was six years old. And, uh, yeah, in that house, it was, very much just eternal as a tiny condominium. Um, interestingly enough, like just walking, like if I walk too heavy, you know, that was an issue, not throwing fucking phones through the wall. <laughs> yeah. It was a noise complaint, you know, but like right. how, how heavy I walked. Uh -huh. um, little just, things like that. But, uh, and, and, you know, you talk about the things we call in to match, you know, like an abusive boyfriend or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, I remember right at right around that age, six and seven, I started either having to run from bullies or turn around and fight them physically at that age. That's wow. when I started fighting. Yeah, wow. at school, yeah. Yeah, at school, on the way home from school. Right. That kind of thing. And that lasted. That lasted all the way up until high school-ish, little bit college. Yeah, but. yeah. So amazing. And did you have siblings? I have one sister who was a year younger than and what was her experience like? Did you feel the need to protect her? Or did she get exposed? Or Yeah, she was exposed to it. Um, <clears throat> jealously, I felt like I got more of the, the brunt of the blow than her. Yeah. Um, but I still, you know, I so, was so connected to her and still am that when I'd see, you know, her. It's okay. Yeah. I get it. I get it. It's a big, for a little boy, that's a big responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. What 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 came to mind as you were thinking about that? Just seeing her cry. Yeah. You know, at dinner. Yeah. And this is around the same age, six, seven and on for a few years. Yeah. So you'd be at dinner and she's just like, your sister's just crying. And what's your experience? Wanting to help her. But, just, but, but also retreating. Yeah. So what would that give you as an experience? 
how would you feel as that little boy? Helpless. Yeah, totally powerless, right? Yeah, so that's a big component of your makeup is that feeling of hopelessness, same as like coming home. I mean, you obviously learn to protect yourself. Where else have you felt that feeling of hopelessness? College, I felt it in relationship, my first long-term relationship. Okay. Yeah. And how so? What did that um, like? It felt like the more I was myself, meaning drunk and obnoxious, yeah. the less that was received. Got it. And um, I identified with like my true self is when I'm happy and drunk and fucking wiling and being crazy. Yeah. Um, and that would obviously push her away. Yeah. So it just felt like I would not, I wasn't going to be loved. Right. That's how it felt. Now, why would you say the drunk, like that was more yourself? Like how did you categorize that as more you? I, I, w I had trouble really being in my own skin, you yeah. know, so I was a class clown. I wanted center of attention when I was away from home, you yeah. know, kind of reversed. Okay. And um, didn't mind talking shit to a teacher's face or to a principal, even if it got me kicked out of the class. Like it was, you know, right. dead silent at home, total revolt Yeah. in school. And um, yeah, I'm not sure where to keep going with that. The How long did that relationship go? Six and a half years. Oh, so it was quite long. Yeah. And then how would that look? Like what would be the energy you're receiving that was like unacceptable? Just a uh, retreat, you know, didn't want to return calls, those kind of things. Okay. I was also on quite a few bad drugs at that point. Yeah. You know, ASU, number one party school in the nation. Right. Coke, ecstasy, playing football, whatever the fuck I wanted, that thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, and bad pharmaceuticals too. So it was a real yo-yo of neurochemistry and everything that I've learned about now, lack of sleep, all that stuff. Right, yeah. Um, yeah. The hopelessness, you know, as it shows up, and can show up in the past few years is in looking at the world at large and seeing where do we fucking go from here? Yeah, yeah How yeah. come I'm the only one seeing this? And maybe Peter and fucking Charles yeah. Eisenstein and a few other great thinkers that I admire. Yeah. But the masses don't want to look at it and can't see it. Yeah, no, absolutely. No, this is beautiful. And it really ties into like that whole, the, the I'm not safe is one of the contexts for sure that you live in. But I'd say for you, now that I know a few more details about your childhood, which I really appreciate you sharing, is it's a little bigger for you. It's a little like the I'm not safe is very subjective, personalized. And we can see that little boy walking around on eggshells, even based on the fact that you're making too much noise, like similar to Eric, right? Like just like he's so petrified to even wake up his dad for fear of the ramifications of getting disciplined or hit or whatever, right? Same for you. Yours is a, a notch above. Right. So you're sitting at the dining table, your sister's crying. So now it's not just you. Do you see the difference? Right. Because it's one thing for Carl to feel not safe, which I get and being hit and the, the madness of whatever's going on between your folks, but your sister's life's in jeopardy. That's how it comes across to that boy, right? They're feeling hopeless. So then how would you relate to that environment? for not just you, but for the two of you? I mean, I think it was just pure chaos. There was no sense of equanimity. Yeah. The girlfriend I had in college for six and a half years, that was the first time I had really witnessed um, what I thought was like a fully functioning nuclear family. Some stability. Yeah. 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 It was mind-blowing. Right. Was like, I mean, it was a true gift to see, oh, yeah. like, that's, this is how it can work. Yeah, you that's know? beautiful. You got to learn the language of some sort of, like, normalcy, some calm, some mm -hmm. kindness, some love, right? Like, which is amazing. And I think for people listening to this, I really want them to understand, like, we talked about that step inside the circle, I think, once before, or maybe you've heard me talk about it. It's a video online where this woman goes into incarceration facilities and asks a series of questions, like, were you raised by a single parent? If the answer is yes to any question, this circle of these badass inmates, they all have to take a step. And you can get the theme, right? So were either of your parents drug addicts? Step inside. And it's just this consistent step, which you start to, at the end, just realize they never even knew what love was. Like they were never taught that language. And so it's no coincidence that they end up 
quote unquote becoming criminals because that's the language they learned, right? Now, God, thank God you've just got the biggest heart and the sweetest kid and the most loving man. But in an environment that was incredibly toxic, you had to learn to survive. But you've also learned how to relate to life, right? So there's your personal, for sure, that you don't feel safe. But what was your relationship to life, would you say? Hmm. Because it includes your sister, and I would say by extension, just again, knowing you, you've sort of, you've expressed that energy, but now for others, right? That you care about, not the whole world, but like, but there's a semblance of that, right? Yeah. So that kid growing up in that environment, being bullied on the way home from school, what is he learning about the world? It's fucking dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that's what came to me, is that you live in a world, because everybody lives in their own world, but for you, you live in a world that you think is dangerous. And now it's being exacerbated, of course, by what's going on the last two or three years, right? 100%. Yeah. So let's just presence that. What's it like for you from age three, four, five, to how old are you now? 40. Yeah. 35 years, you've been living in a world that to you is dangerous. And you've armed yourself accordingly, which we could say is smart, like you've coped, right? Through the fighting, through the drugs, farmer or otherwise, through the, the guns, through the size. But your whole relationship to life is the world is dangerous. Now just let that sink in. What's that like to walk around in a world that wherever you go, it's dangerous? There's no peace in it. Ever. You're in a constant war zone. Now, just get that. Your whole nervous system is, you are in a constant war zone. Now, it's become normalized for you, but as you presence that, that is far from normal. Where else does that show up? It doesn't show up in my relationship now, thankfully. No. Yeah. Because of plant medicines and our work together and <clears throat> together for ten plus years. Yeah. Know, yeah. Feel like it's it's separate and that's almost the balancing point of if I was to say we're in total polarity, what I see in the external world is is counterbalanced by my friendships, my relationships, yeah. The job that I get to do and the things that I get to learn and the people I get to hang with. Yeah. You know, like that's that's what evens it out. If it was even Stevens. For sure. And I can tell you, if you didn't have that, you wouldn't be here because you would literally be on a battlefield or you'd be on the streets or you'd be a terrorist, right? So it's by courtesy of the destiny of who you are with the size of heart and love you have that you've manifested a point of stability. Do you understand? So if someone lives in the world, the world of their own, their own, that the world is dangerous, that has to become manifest, right? Meaning if somebody thinks that who they are is a piece of shit, either they're going to compensate for it and become like this perfectionist people pleaser as a coping mechanism, or they're going to go right into it and they'll be on the streets doing meth. So because you have that, you aren't out there in a world literally that is a world of danger, like you're on the front lines in wherever, right? Do you see that? Yeah. But I want you to understand systematically, in terms of your central nervous system, it's still where you live. Correct. That's why I wanted to bring it up because uh, my intention coming into this week, as I, as I really thought of it, treating the Fit for Service Summit as a ceremony and I, I get to participate in it as I also get coaching it, right? I'm always learning yeah. from these experiences. Yeah. Uh, when we did the circling exercise, I realized that I still don't have peace. Yeah. And it just, you know, a little blip of yeah. like, oh, yeah, I don't feel that. I feel a sense of unease yeah. constantly if I pay attention to it. Yeah. Like Eric said, it's always there. Even though he may not be, quote, unquote, stuttering, it's always there. What is always there? The fear, the anticipation, the intrepidation of that, like, going to happen, the trepidation. So for you, likewise, you've got the beautiful family, you've got the beautiful tribe, you've done the plant medicines, you've got a lot of knowledge, but the nervous system is still relating to life as though it's fucking dangerous out there. So if that's your relation to life, how, what's your 
consistent theme in the way that you feel, the way that you act, the way that you behave? I can't. No, the theme doesn't come to mind, but but my the actions that come to mind are I'm in a state of doing, preparing, um, taking action towards the things that help me sleep at night. Yeah. And what are those actions? Just it might be going to the sheepdog with Tim Kennedy and learning how to do firearms training. It might be yeah. Um, our permaculture specialist teaching us how to grow our own food and have food sovereignty. With all the yeah, fucking all that going on. Yeah, you know? yeah. So if we were to categorize that under one label, one way of being, what are you doing? Learning those things is in order to what? Prepare for a shit show. Yeah. And in preparation for a shit show, you could say that you're doing what for yourself and your family? Safeguarding. Yeah, uh, protecting. Protect right. So now think about it in terms of, like you said, the things to help you sleep. If somebody is in a mode, their whole system, of that whatever I have to do, the behaviors are in order to protect myself. So if I have to protect myself, is that a state of ease or disease? Disease. Yeah. Chronic. Chronic. Chronic disease, right? But that experience of having to protect oneself is only a byproduct of the fact that the way you relate to life is that you're not safe, and by extension for you, much bigger, the world is dangerous. Like, not, I'm not safe, that's for fucking clear, but I can kind of handle myself, but my sister's not safe. And then other people I know who I care about aren't safe. So now you're charged with this responsibility that in a world that is dangerous, it's up to Kyle to make sure everyone's okay. And then slap you on the button, you know, have a nice sleep. <laughs> Rest well, darling. <laughs> right? You yeah. sort of see the contradiction there. Yeah. So now, based on what you've seen me already do with other people, what's what's the predominant lie that you're living in? Like, we get the world of it. Like, anyone listening to this, and we could sort of hang out there more, and there'd be more tears. And But, like, you're smart enough. You've done enough work. We don't need to keep living in the world of, like, fucking everything is dangerous. Like, you've lived there for 30-something years, right? So, so if that's your world, we see the reactions, we see the response, we see the preparation, we see the need to protect. It's It's literally unavoidable for you to not feel the need to protect because the way you relate to life is that it's dangerous. Do you see that? Like it's inextricably connected. It's an extension of that reality. But the cost to you of constantly having to protect, how else, like you've learned to manage it, you do well, you've got good people around you, but what are some of the costs to you of living in a world where you constantly have to protect? Well, I mean, physiologically, it's visceral. Like, I just feel a, a tightness and a constriction uh, around my midsection, you know, where it's like, yeah. sometimes it's in the jaw, but most of the time it's like I can't have a deep breath yeah. or it takes me running, lifting weights or fuck blowing my lungs open to get there. Yeah. Um, like, literally exercising the demons to then yeah. rest calmly. Yeah. Um, yoga for an hour and a half just so I can meditate for 20 minutes, you know, like, just so I can sit still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And thank God you're built like an ox because otherwise that manifests as like a lot of problems, right? Sickness and disease. Yeah, I've had and, tinkering for sure, you know, yeah. to, and lots of injuries to yeah, yeah. not listening to that. So yeah, I, I've yeah. built a decent relationship there listening to my body. But the, the deeper listening, uh, I was really unaware of until yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> God damn it, dude. <laughs> I was honestly, I was so touched. I mean, you're obviously tall and huge, but I like I could see that <laughs> that fucking arm. <laughs> That's me. Like I was like, yep, there it is. I love that. And yeah. it touched the ceiling if I could. Yeah. yeah, and I just love the vulnerability, and that just speaks volumes about you as such a sweetheart, right? And we're gonna we're gonna reinstate that way of being for you. So, what is the predominant lie that you're living in? The world's dangerous. Yeah. Now, why is that a lie? Well, if I look at my life past childhood, it has not been dangerous unless I decided yeah. to make it so in the UFC or something like that. Yeah. And even that relatively not 
dangerous on a life or death standpoint. And certainly not in the way that you're relating to it, right? Correct. Like painful, you know, injurious maybe, but like not necessarily dangerous. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's a level of threat there. But yeah, so again, at your ripe old age, you probably still have another hopefully 50, 60 years. And if I was to tell you that even everything that's transpiring and the sadness that's out there, like, you know, Tim and the work he does and the sex trafficking that's going on and kids are being brutally ripped apart for organs and like this stuff is happening, right? Like we can't just turn a blind eye. There's just a lot of tragedy out there that's horrific. But if your life, your family, your community, nothing substantial happens for the remaining 60 years of your life, yet you lived as though it was going to be just that next moment. Could you see the difference between another 60 years of the world is dangerous, constantly the perpetual need to protect with all of the different behaviors you have, the way that you have to mitigate that with meditation running to try and dissipate the tension in your body, to do that for 60 years? Or what I just propose is that nothing other than you know, stubbing a toe on a table once in a while or cutting yourself shaving or, you know, someone breaks up, but they're okay. And, you know, no real danger ever happens. What would that life be like? It'd be a lot better. It would be peaceful, even from a Bruce Lee standpoint. You know, you don't gauge emotional. You don't fight in anger, right? Right. If you come from a state of peace, your awareness is expanded and you're actually better at protecting yourself. Absolutely. So even from like an optimization standpoint yeah. to fighting, it's better if I'm coming from a place of peace. Yeah. And now it's so beautiful. So you can see those, it's like literally, you know, I talk about like this sort of linear progression of someone's life, right? Like, so we could see Kyle here, little boy, super scared, fucking sisters crying at the table, feels powerless, gets to a point where he's seven or eight, kind of fights off some kids, maybe gets beaten up by others, but he's slowly learning this linear trajectory of self-protection that incorporates others because of your <laughs> beautiful sister that you wanted to protect too, right? And so now you understand permaculture protection, but, you know, a little more holistic. Then you know how to handle every fucking kind of gun and you could kick the shit out of me in five seconds, you know? It's like, <laughs> like you've learned these skills, but it's on a linear trajectory. But what I'm talking about is this vertical ascension where you literally live at a different frequency. So that 60 years of living in fight or flight, mitigating it, managing it as best as you can, probably later in life getting all sorts of sicknesses because of your system just can't sustain it. Or you go to a different frequency where that next future 60 years, there's the absence of any danger. That's an entirely different experience, right? So now here's the irony. The thing that you are, like you witness with me working with other people, what's the real danger to you? The real danger is in continuing to perpetuate the lie. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? So I want you to understand, because you're so smart, your brain, maybe until this moment, has thought the danger is out there. But the real danger to you as a being is the thought that the world is dangerous. <laughs> is that nuts? That is the only literal threat that's impacting your life. Is that you have it. It's not like a belief. It, it, it is the way it is for you. It's so ingrained and we can have all the compassion for that little kid that developed the evidence to prove that you live in my fucking house. It's fucking dangerous. And then that became part of the way that you relate to life. It's not like a thought or a superstition of like, no, I think the world's dangerous, but then you get on with it. No, no, the world is dangerous. But the real danger to you, your health, your wealth, your, your freedom, your peace is your own thought the way that you are, that the world is, which is maybe a weird way of saying it, but the way that you are, that the world is, is that the world is dangerous. That is the most dangerous thing in your entire life. Now just get that. 
The only thing that is threatening your life, the thing that hurts you the most, is your own relationship to life. Did you see that? Well, I got a glimpse of it yesterday, you know. Yeah. But um, obviously, there was there was more to it, and so I wanted to bring it up here for <laughs> for a freebie, free coaching session. <laughs> <laughs> and as I tend to do, expose myself on this podcast. Yeah, which is beautiful. Did you get what I'm saying? It's, a, really it's, want- it's because it's like written in to the software. You know, you talked about the hardware software. Yeah. Um. Yeah, it's not something I play with intellectually it's it's something that i downloaded and encoded into the software of the operating system yeah from a young age that's what i'm saying it's systematic and this is why it's going to take a little bit to un just sort of detangle from this right but what i want you to get is so i'm going to give you an example that will help maybe to sort of show you what i'm pointing out i was uh, speaking at an event in minnesota the driver picked me up and he was very flattering he's like i love your podcast you've really helped and he said, can I ask you a question? And I was like, sure. And he says, um, you know, I've really been struggling with something for my entire life since I was a kid. And like, I said, okay, what's that? He said, well, I'm a claustrophobic. And so I struggle to be around people. I go to a, an event and I feel like I need to like get out of there. And I'm always like worried about where can, where's my exit and stuff like that. And I totally could have compassion. I got it. I said, okay, well, we've just met, but I'm going to guess at some point as a kid, like, you were put in a position where you really felt that. He's like, yeah, yeah, I was probably about fifth, sixth grade and my buddies locked me in a fridge, an old fridge, but like a fridge, right? Like, and he's a kid, like, you know, and he's he fucking panic, right? Like terror. And I said, wow, that must've been so scary. He's like, yeah, I still have nightmares. And I said, okay, and, and how you were like, how old? He said, well, like 11 or something like that. And I said, and how old are you now? And he's like, I don't know, 43. And I'm like, okay. So for 38 years, you've had this experience. You've been to, he said, I've done therapy, hypnotherapy. I said, yeah, so I get it. And um, I said, so there's one thing you said that I just really want you to revisit. And he's like, well, that, what's that? I said, it's kind of the first thing you said, which is I'm a claustrophobic. And I said, so like, what does that mean? Like, like you are a claustrophobic. Like, and he's, well, yeah, it's like a diagnosis. Like, that's what I struggle, all the symptoms I have. I'm like, oh, okay, interesting. So, we like, were you always that way? Or like, were you born a claustrophobic? <laughs> like, was that like, <laughs> <laughs> like when people say I'm Christian, I'm like, oh, okay, interesting. Like, okay. Anyway, that's a whole other topic. <laughs> <laughs> that's a rabbit hole for sure. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I said, or oh, did it kind of start from that moment in the fridge? He's like, well, probably from that. I'm like, okay, so there was an event that was like, in your case, like 38 years ago or 31 years ago, or whatever it is. And, and now you've declared yourself from that moment as that's who you are. And he's like starting to notice, like, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, so, so scary moment, terrifying. Like you're stuck, black, can't breathe much. And like, that's fucking horrible. But they, you got out, and he's like, "Yeah, it's probably shorter than I thought." But when you're in it, like, I was like, "Yeah, I get it's it." An earthquake. Yeah, it's like it's scary. And um, and I said, "So, is it true that you're actually claustrophobic, or did you have a moment where you felt claustrophobic that was a tight space?" So now he's starting to see. Okay, was well, so, and then he started to see. Okay, well, yeah. And I said, "Did you always feel it, or do you sometimes you're okay in certain situations?" He's like, "No, sometimes I'm okay." So I'm like, "Okay, so first of all, it's not consistent. So, you know, the truth is always consistent. So if it varies, then it's not true." He's like, "Oh, okay." I said, "You know what? Can I tell you something really funny?" I said, "He's like, yeah." I said, "The thing that creates the most claustrophobic thing that is going on in your life is the thought I'm a claustrophobic." I was like, that's such a confining thought. <laughs> and like, he really got it. Like, he's like, holy shit. Like, I'm the claustrophobia I experience is because of the thought that I'm a claustrophobic. Like, if I take a glass of water, the water takes on the shape of the glass. If I pull that into a vase, it's now a vase of water or a bowl of water. But the water will take on the form based on what it's contained in. So I said, <clears throat> who you are is boundless, timeless, but you live within the context called I'm a claustrophobic and therefore you have to experience claustrophobia. That makes sense? So Kyle, pure love, free being, powerful, 
limitless, but lives in what container? I'm a protector. I'm a warrior. That's what you do because of the container, which is? The world is dangerous. Yeah. So if you live inside the world is dangerous, you have zero choice, zero choice, but to act in accordance with that reality. The warrior, the protector, go and learn everything about guns, fighting. Do you see? It's all commensurate with the world is dangerous. So it begs a question, can you categorically tell me as a truth, meaning it has to be consistent across all forms, yes or no, that the world is dangerous? No, it is not. No. Give me at least three pieces of evidence, even if it's just this last few days that shows you the world is not dangerous. Yeah. I mean, you look at our event for the last few days. Look at um, my entire relationship with my wife and our two incredible kids. Yeah. There's no danger in any of that. Only just opening yeah. and opening. Challenging, but not dangerous by any means. Yeah. Just pure love. Yeah. We're just inundated and surrounded by people who all they want to do is love. And yet, over there, walking around amongst literal, like present love, kindness, compassion, care, evolution, transformation, is a guy who's in his own world called the world is dangerous. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> I thought you were smart. <laughs> yeah. It's big though. Really big. Because I'm not, I'm not safe, I get, and there's a component of that, but yours is like 10x that which also explains all of your aptitudes and your skills that you've developed in that world. So is it true that the world is dangerous? No, it is no. not true. Uh, and, and there's whatever's going on. Yeah. Right? And that too. Yeah, it does exist. There's stuff going on, but we don't know what the next 60 something years of your life looks like, you may never encounter danger in the way that you are relating to life. You know, someone cut you off in traffic, was close, almost had an accident. Was that dangerous? Well, it could have been, wasn't. You know, somebody maybe threatened you at a restaurant or a bar. They've had one too many cocktails. They don't like the way you look, or they just, whatever, they're just trying to pick a fight. But because of who you are, they back down. Nothing really happened. Like, there may be the sort of the, potential for something that never actualizes. Yet you live in perpetual state, or did, hopefully, that, yeah, but you've got to look out because because the world is dangerous. It's like an is. See, words are so powerful and people don't understand this. People think the way that they speak, and this is going to be huge for you, People think the way they speak is descriptive. You think you're describing the world. But guess what you're doing? Words are creative. You get that? Yeah. Yeah, buddy. That's, that's deep. See, you had it until I just said what I just said. You thought you were describing the world. What have you been doing? Creating the world, creating my world. Which is, or was? The world was dangerous. And you were perpetually creating it that way. Isn't that nuts? And therefore you had to, you had to, with all the compassion in the world based on how you were brought up, you had no choice but to react to the world that you unknowingly were perpetually creating. How would Kyle feel if Whatever's transpiring, you know, we could argue that a lot of people are waking up and we're oblivious. And for sure, there's some souls that are using this as a time to check out, right? They don't have the bandwidth to stay here. They succumb, they comply, they, whatever's happening. But within two, three, five years, there's this sort of revelation, this sort of 60s, but more evolved kind of free love and the overturning of the oligarchs and people are like free and living off the land and there's this new sense of community. 
But that couldn't have happened if it weren't for the travesties of these last few years. But that's going to happen. That's the future we're headed towards. How does Kyle feel? Joyous. At right. ease. Yeah, I'm, I want that future. Yeah. yeah. That's a fuck yeah future. Right. But that fuck yeah future can't exist. Here's the irony. I know you're such a stand for that world. But you can't access it because you were perpetually creating that the world is dangerous. So this will be hard for you to hear, but all the people you see out there as the quote-unquote bad guys creating the tyranny, creating the abuse and the hostility, the world you created for yourself is no different. Yeah, it was my own prison. But energetically, it's a contribution to the whole. So where's the tyranny? That's the part, as I said, it's hard to hear because I know your love, but what you've been up to is contributing to tyranny, which for your brain is like, whoa, like I'm, I'm a stand for the opposite, but energetically you're not. I've wondered that, you know, and then looking into others and seeing them in yourself or parts work, any of these other things, you know, and, and, and uh, it's been very hard to relate to anyone I would put on that list, you know, of people that are causing the fuckery. And, yeah. um, and as much as I try, even with medicines or in meditation, it's been hard to relate until the way you just worded it. And I was like, that, that is how I sign off on what's happening. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So here you are, a stand for love, kindness, community, like respect, reverence of the feminine, like mother life, Gaia, like really, that's who I see you to be. But it's all shackled, waiting, waiting until the world is safe. But it can't be because the way you relate to life or was is that it's dangerous. So it never will be in that context. Never. You would have gone to the grave for the next 60 years, aside from hopefully this conversation, as a guy who was a stand, who people loved, who knew everything about every fucking type of gun, knife and whatever, and chokehold, <laughs> <laughs> but never found peace because he thought the world was dangerous, not realizing the world was in him. That's pretty big. How does that hit you? Softening. Yeah. Yeah, I just feel the... <sighs> Maybe the breath that you couldn't normally access. Yeah. I feel uh, just a softening and an opening inside. This is how powerful you are. That kid at the table whose sister was crying, I get I get the powerlessness of that. But you're so powerful, you are creating your world. And life, the universe will reflect that. Because see, if you really get that this world of 8 billion people, whatever it is, if everybody experienced what you just feel right now as a softening, where's the tyranny out there? Isn't any. Yeah. So now you can be responsible. Not that you're out there mutilating or sex trafficking children or lying about drugs or whatever, but your energy, no different, was. That's a big pill to swallow. It's one I know you can handle. But if you want to see how powerful you are, your energy was contributing to the tyranny that you think you're fighting. That's a powerful thing to see. Right? I uh, know you don't want to be that guy. Right? No. So what's the possibility for Carl now? The possibility is living in peace. Totally, right? And seeing a different world. Co-creating a different world. Yeah. 
for as powerful as you are, my friend, like on every level, physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, like you have a gift to help usher, give birth to a world that is love. Because that's what you see. Were you present for the birth of your kids? Oh, yeah. Caught them both. Yeah. Was it easy? Was it pretty? Was it elegant? Was it like... <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot like hunting. It was fucking <laughs> all the things. Yeah. All of it at once. But what was the container that you held for your wife and the kid that was arriving? Pure love. Pure love and attention and care. So what if... You know, the tearing of the perineum and the blood and the fucking passing out and all the stuff that can happen in that beautiful container is what we're witnessing on mass. It's messy. Mm, yeah. It's messy. It's ugly. It's painful. Fucking screaming everywhere. Scared. Don't know what the fuck's going to happen next. Is this going to go on forever? Is she going to be okay? Right? But it's a birth. And during a birth, there's a lot of pain. But you already have practiced holding a container of love, even in the presence of literal mess, mark, shit, pain. Didn't phase you because there's this commitment to what's on the other side, which is new life. That's what we're here for. <laughs> There's such okay, a... Yeah. <laughs> that's a different human isn't it yeah meanwhile you fucking garnered some great skills that's awesome <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know in the event of but like you fucking walk around like a peaceful warrior a uh, warrior in a garden you know yeah shit hits the fan oh yeah I got that skill set but I don't think about it because I probably never have to use it because I'm committed to a world of love the world is beautiful the world is kind the world is gracious. I'd take three of those over the world is dangerous. Absolutely. Yeah. So if Kyle adopts the relationship to life that the world is beautiful, what's that feel like? It feels pretty fucking good. Yeah. I felt that about aspects of it, you know, that nature yeah. is beautiful and the witnessing of that is, is a, a God nod, a little touch. Yeah, but within that, what if you witnessed a nature that isn't to the untrained eye beautiful? Give me one example. <laughs> nature is metal. You know, the account on Instagram that Rogan's always posting? Oh, uh, okay. Nature is metal. I don't know if you're familiar no, with that. No. I'll fucking link to it. Um, okay. Yeah, it's just, you know, badass shit, like a woman getting mauled by a tiger ripped out of her car or... You know, a chimpanzee escapes and rips the zookeeper's arm off. Just anything, you know. Or even, uh, yeah, just, just you know, the animals, herbivore animals eating the young of other competitive animals that compete for the grassland. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the more hardcore, you know. And yet you can contain that in the perspective, your translation of it's still beauty because yeah. that's just what happens. Yeah. What, you think like the evolution of humanity is going to just be like fucking rainbows and unicorns? <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't track that way backwards. So <laughs> no. my guess is, you know, as the wheel keeps spinning that it... <laughs> yeah. 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 But it's like the laws of averages, right? Like if there's 8 billion people and 5, 6 billion of them are still in their dark, their version of the world is dangerous. You know, I could assert, without putting you on the spot, you're contributing to the darkness more than most people because their energy is more about them. Yours is collective. Mm. <laughs> They're like, oh, I'm not safe. I'm an idiot. I'm bad, like we saw yesterday. Like, I'm not going to be okay. And there's that subjective fear. But you were really embodying collective fear. So in terms of the level of contribution to the collective dog, like, <laughs> kind of did a pretty shitty job. <laughs> or a good job. If, if we're going to compare. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's pretty funny, right? Yeah. And that you would assert completely the opposite. Like you'd actually kick, fight someone. Yeah. <laughs> oh, fuck yeah. you. I'll beat the shit out of you. Yeah, I'm, I'm all for love. I'll fucking break your arm. It's like, oh, wow, that's so beat loving. Into you. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that you're very loving as I can barely breathe in a choke lock. <laughs> <laughs> right, it's kind of funny, right? 
you start to see, holy shit, like, am I really a stand for love or am I perpetuating danger? Hmm. Yeah. Crazy. That is crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I get, I had a sense of the collective, you know, as I was driving here, thinking about what we we're going to podcast and I already knew I was going to bring up uh, Ghazi and the work you were doing yesterday, but the, and how that ties to the world, but the, the collective piece I hadn't understood, you know, my own contribution to it. Yeah. And um, why that was so important was because my, my view of it was collective. Yeah. Not just personal. Exactly. And that's why you look at someone like Eric, what he was going through, he, he was worried about him relative to society. It's how most people walk around. They're just really in their own world. But you're so powerful and this is like the beauty of opposites. Now we get to transmute that into like the fight for good, not as a fight, but the stand for love and all the things that you really would assert you are for, but now your system can align with it. Mm. Like you can relate to life when you walk out of this room, but life is fucking beautiful. That's how I live. I was at a workshop once and this guy came up and he was super like markety and salesy. And like I was with this girl who had brought me to this thing. And, you know, so he's probably trying to enroll me in whatever fucking thing they're trying to sell. And like I could feel it in a second, you know, like, hey, wow, good to see you. You know, it's like, he's Time like, sure in Costa Rica. <laughs> <Right>? Exactly. <laughs> uh, that I might have fallen for. But <laughs> <laughs> so he, uh, he's like, yeah, so who are you? And I just said to him, I'm the luckiest man in the world. And it, he, it just stopped him, you know, like, because he didn't know what to say to that. It's not like part of his script of what someone says. And then he goes to his next line. But it also showed me something that I was able to generate on the spot because words are creative, not descriptive. And I've kind of stuck by that ever since because I created it. And where's my evidence? I mean, I could point to things. It's not a truth, but it's the stand. It's the container that I'm choosing to live within. So even in the face of the blood and the pain and the screaming of your wife as this beautiful baby is coming through, who you are is love. So what if in the face of whatever we're still going to see that unfolds, the tyranny, the lies, the wars, the, de the deception, the corruption, like, yeah, we could go, oh, they're fucking idiots. And, but what energy are you adopting at that moment? Tyranny, disrespect. It's not to say you condone it. It's not to say that these are people you want to come to Thanksgiving, you know, but it's like, it's a dying breed. The expression fear will break its own heart. Mm. That's what's happening. They're all breaking their own hearts right now and they're just desperate. They're scared children. Yeah. And that actually warrants a bit of compassion. Yeah. Right? Yeah, you, big time. Do your kids behave impeccably all the time? <laughs> Fuck no. <laughs> <laughs> no. I love getting new parents around that have the glow. You know, yeah. like, what's it like? And I'm like, it's all of it. It's not, it's, <laughs> it's not any one thing. Yeah. It's all fucking awesome and it's all of it. It's, yeah. it's fucking everything in between. It's all of it. Yeah, and if you were to give one title to all of that, who are you in the face of all of that? Love. Yeah. Yeah. So you have the microcosm... I'm not going to say perfected, but certainly to a certain degree of mastery, which is that you hold a container of love for all of it. Now we take that, apply it to the macro. Not only is the world not dangerous, the world is love. Because that's who I am to it. Then see what shows up. Probably won't need a assault rifle. <laughs> But I got such a good one. I got a six and a half Creedmoor 18 inch. It's so good. God, you'd love it. It's like, it's like driving a Bentley. It's so nice. <laughs> well, you can clean it and admire it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a different world, isn't it? Yeah. It's definitely a different Kyle. Yeah, brother. How'd you feel? I feel peace for the first time in a long time. Like I just, I talked about that opening and then it just... We kept talking and it slowly just expanded and I feel warm in my hands and my face and yeah. like blood and energy is flowing through my periphery. Yeah. Not constricted. That's pretty cool, isn't it? 
It's fucking wild. <laughs> I got the microdose of it yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now we're getting yeah, give me some more of that. Yeah, a couple more cups. <laughs> yeah. Please, sir, can I have some more? Yeah, 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 dude. You're just you're just such a pleasure to be with, you know. And I get it. I get why that little boy that's still been running through your veins, why he's there, and we love him, but we don't let him run your life. It's a part of you that is not you that felt the world was dangerous. Really get that. It's a part of you that's not you that thought the world was dangerous. The real you is so big, it's the container to even allow that little kid who's scared, just like you will for your kids, they'll get scared. Dad's like, don't worry about it, I got you. Yeah. Now you get to do that for your little, little part that it's living in a lie. Yeah. Understandable, but it's a lie. You know, kids believe in the Easter Bunny and fucking Santa and your little boy thought the world was dangerous. It's kind of adorable. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. Is the world dangerous? No. No. It's what it is and we'll see what unfolds. Yeah. But who you are and who I am is love. So be that. That's beautiful, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That brings us right to the fucking hour mark. <laughs> I know you got another podcast with Ob coming up. Yeah. You're, you're for Pete. Uh, I got to talk later today, so I'm going to hit the land and yeah. enjoy nature's beauty and love. Yeah. Go and see, because you are the world that you see. So go and not see the world, but create it based on the way that you're looking at it. Hmm. I love that. I did an exercise once in this realm because I, like all of us, have those different constraints that I help people unfold. I had to work through them myself. And mine wasn't perhaps to the extent of the whole world is dangerous, but I thought maybe I was in danger periodically depending on where. And I walked around one day and I was like, I walked around in the world of everybody loves me. And the shit that unfolded that day... That's was, true, though, Peter. Everyone well, does love you. I mean, come on, I son. fucking created it. <laughs> Just on a fucking stretch of the imagination, you're awesome, buddy. When I was young and I was isolated and I was orphaned and I thought I was by myself, that was not how the world occurred to me. Mm. But thank you, yeah. So was it the way that it was or did I create that and subsequently that's what showed up, do you see? Yeah. So if who Kyle is to the world is, the world is love, we could probably guess what's going to show up. Might not be tomorrow. You'll get glimpses today. Might not be in a week, the collective. But you keep standing there. You're a fucking force of nature. I don't like the world's chances against that. <laughs> Try and be dangerous, right? Do you see? Yeah, brother. Words are creative, not descriptive. That's I love that. Thank you, brother. You're welcome. Thank you. Where can people find you? Uh, talk about your mastermind. Are you still taking people in for that online? Yeah, that we're the the one we're in right now will come to an end, I think, uh, beginning of April. So we'll probably start another one in May. Uh, it's a three month container, which is just fucking tears to the eyes, powerful witnessing me do this, but en masse in a group with many people, different stories. So everyone can vicariously relate. Um, and we meet every two weeks. It's sort of a morning session, theory, afternoon coaching. Uh, but also now I've got something called the Freedom Community. So some people can't access the mastermind. It might be a little bit out of the budget or something. But the Freedom Community is just a container again where I put exclusive content. It's super affordable per month. So it's the same kind of feel of a commitment that's committed to evolving and being free. Hence the Freedom Community. And then just Instagram, Peter Crone. People can find me there. I love it. Thank you so much, brother. It's been an honor and a pleasure getting to know you and getting to hang with you more. And uh, yeah, we will remedy the the time in between and get that gap shorter and shorter. Yeah, I like that commitment, especially now, you know, if you're not too busy trying to fucking protect everyone because the world is dangerous. <laughs> it's so difficult to get a hold of that guy. I don't know. He's out there covered in fucking boot polish or something. <laughs> boot polish, yeah. He's sniping. Come on. I'm here. Come get me. <laughs> I love you, brother. Thank you. I love you too.